that has a protective effect. So, Welcome to Cambridge Community Television, What We Should Know, coming to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. This evening's program is going to be an interview with David Lowry, uh, accomplished painter and local artist with deep roots uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, David Lowry returned uh, from Vietnam in the late 1960s to begin his recovery and a career as a painter uh, at Fenway Studios uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. David is an accomplished painter and member of the Massachusetts Guild of Fine Artists uh, who received an award uh, last month for a self-portrait, double-framed uh, self-portrait, which hopefully he will uh, be able to say uh, something about today. Uh, David has also been awarded a sabbatical uh, to paint in one of uh, Europe's uh, most picturesque cities uh, this summer. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce David Lowry. Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd really <clears throat> like to talk about this evening is uh, a subject that's not really addressed and should be addressed by artists. That is artist workspace, the studio. And I'd like to very briefly just go through how studios evolved. And um, as we live in a world now where there's a much broader range of art styles and how, how one approaches work, uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid that we're losing sight of how traditional painters work in their workspace. And I'd just like to have a small discussion on um, the, these uh, rooms that were very carefully evolved and thought out to be ideal working space for accomplished artists. And uh, that's what I want to talk about this evening. So where will you begin, David? Um, well, <clears throat> for me, Traditional painting started in Europe, Western European painting started in two centers, Italy and the Low Countries. So I'm just going to start with, we have an image of Rembrandt studio in this house in Amsterdam. And just looking at the, the Dutch point of view, because the Dutch were, were real, realist painters and the Italians tend to be more idealistic in their interpretation of nature. So I'm sticking with the Itali with the Dutch school and uh, how how studio spaces evolved came from Europe and, and evolved in America and in particularly Boston. So uh, oh we already got this on. So <clears throat> this is an image of Rembrandt Studio in Amsterdam. It's very careful to to note here that see how evenly lit his canvases. I do, yes. Very carefully. It's all even daylight on it. It's very important that artists have even daylight on their canvas and that they work in a north exposure so that you don't get the sunlight, direct sunlight coming in the studio. And as we all know, the earth is revolving, which causes the sunlight to course through the studio all day, constantly changing the light effect. So North Light Studios, this, by the 17th century, it was perfectly understood that you have to, uh, for, for painters to use North Light Studios to get even light. And, here's, and but this is Rembrandt's home again, and you had, he had three windows in this particular studio. And then, now we're going to switch to, <coughs> this is a studio building in uh, Chicago, in the 19th century, people continued on with converting their homes into artist studios, and this building was converted from a, a townhouse into an, an art school, which it still is today. And they put skylights on the roof, and they have some, window, some north light exposure, although the windows, because this is a house, and uh, the windows aren't ideal for, uh, for painting from nature. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're adequate to a point, but with the skylight, it makes it quite fine. This is another building that was converted 
not converted. This was perfectly, purposely built for artists. The windows are larger, facing north. And uh, there's another building from Chicago. Chicago and New York had a lot of these buildings that still survive. That's why I'm showing these images. And then we, we come to Boston. This here is an image of the Grunman Studios which was actually on the MIT campus in the, when, when MIT was on the back bay of Boston. And again, you see very high lights, if, if we can make it out, you see very high windows so you get a, a downward light coming on your model and on your canvas. Again, it's very important that you get north light, large windows facing north that brings in a consistent and even light. But again, this is this seems to be that I've never because I've only known this structure from these drawings. There was, uh, I've never seen a photograph of, the, of this actual building. Uh, I'm not even sure when it was when it was actually destroyed. MIT moved around the turn of the century from the Back Bay over to Cambridge. And uh, what I'm showing now is this is a, a map of the city of Boston in an area just the beginning of the South End. This is Hotcourt Street and the Hotcourt Street Studio Building. I, I, I'm sorry to say I don't know when this building was actually constructed, but I do know this. In 1905, this, 19, excuse me, 1904, this building burnt. And it was a devastation for an awful lot of artists in Boston. One of the, one of one of the most famous artists who was there. Two two very prominent artists whose works in many museums, Paxton, William McGregor Paxton, and Joseph de Camp, both had studios there. Paxton was fortunate in that he was having a one man show. Uh, so most. Uh, just about all his work were out, were, were not, were out, out of the building when the fire happened. The camp, unfortunately, lost much of his early work, and he, he actually was able to save a few of his canvases himself that, the night of the fire. And uh, Weren't the Fenway Studios then built shortly after that? Isn't that what you mentioned, David, that that was a fortunate development in Boston? Well, because of the fire, and so many artists were misplaced from the Hotcourt Studio fire, in 1905, members of the St. Patolf Club and the Copley Society formed a small, I guess you could call it, corporation that built this studio. This is a modern, this is the Fenway Studios, 1905. And notice, I think it's fascinating to see how studio buildings are evolving. We went from these houses, converted houses and simple structures into these more modern, Perfectly, look, this is another view of the Fenway show. This gives you an idea. There's 110 windows facing north here. Each window is approximately six feet wide by 12 feet high. This gives you a, a studio, this studio building is really a, a light box facing north. That's a great description. And you have your studio in there, do you? Yes, my studio is actually right here. Uh -huh. And, uh, we have three different, well, four different size studios, and I'm in the average size studio. There's some smaller ones, and and, and there's uh, eight studios slightly larger. Anyways, uh, so important is that it's facing north. You mentioned it's, right? it's 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 absolutely critical, and it rather saddens me that uh, lately I've, uh, I'm very interested in the Dutch school of painting, and I've been reading many of our highly respected scholars, very accomplished men, have been talking about Vermeer's work and are now saying that Vermeer worked in a south-lit studio, which is absolutely impossible. It's, it saddens me that 
Of course, these are men of the 21st century who basically live in an artificially lit world. They, they have, they're being removed from the world of Rembrandt, or actually my world. I live in a daylit studio, basically, and anybody who visits me know that you know, I don't have any artificial light on at all during the day. Only direct moth light coming in. So let's get a look at the next slide then, David. All right, and this here shows an interior. This is an architectural rendering, architect's rendering of the Fenway Studios. These, these studios were inspired, by the way, by Parisian studio buildings. In Paris, which was at center of the art in the late 19th century, many Boston painters, Joseph the Camp, Tarbell, Benson, Paxton, Vinton, many of these painters went to Europe to study, and most of them were in Paris. And the French had developed a, 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 a large buildings that had these workspaces that were ideally suited for painting. And again, we, we see here, this, this is very similar to what my studio looks like. Large windows facing north, there's a walkway, a main hall outside on each floor, and when you come into the studio, you actually come in through this door and you're on the balcony, so you're looking down on the workspace. The ceilings are actually 14 feet tall, the windows are 12 feet, and uh, another element here is this is an interior shot of the studio. There were, the shades came down from the bottom as well as up from the top. Oh, I see. Those that windows we're looking at the bottom yeah, third the bottom, or quarter of it are shaded. They're shaded. They're coming. They come up from the bottom. So this way, we you can have either a very high light. If you have the bottom shade drawn up here, you have a very high light, like a Rembrandt painting. Or, or you can lower the, the bottom shades all the way down and, have, and then bring the top shades down halfway and you can have a cross light, like a Vermeer painting. And uh, also, uh, in my studio, I have these, what I call splash curtains, these curtains on on arms that swing out so that you can, uh, it's not on there, uh, so that uh, have these arms that, could, uh, that swing out from the windows on, with curtains on them so I can control slot the side light. So the, the, all of the daylight can be controlled in your studio. So I can pretty much duplicate a highlight as I said, like, like, like one sees in Rembrandt or the, or the lower light that you see in Vermeer's work. Another interesting thing about the Fenway Studios when it was first built, all the woodwork in the studio, including the floors, was all stained very, very dark, very dark colors. Uh, What's the Jacobean. reason for that? And the reason for that, again, was controlling light. So you have when the daylight comes in, it, it doesn't reflect off light woodwork or the light floors. There's no reflected light. So any reflected light that you have on your subject, and again, when these people, when, when this building was, was put up, artists were working with models in these studios so that they had um, any reflected light on the model, they, the artist could control. He could put a panel up behind, behind the model and get exactly the light effect he wanted. It was critical to get exactly the amount of daylight that he wanted in his work. Let's get back to the Fenway Studio shot that you have there. Yeah, this here, again, this architectural rendering, these windows, again, the light, the shades come up from the bottom and down from the top, so you get, and you can block off entire windows. I can, I've, I've worked this out so that I can pretty much duplicate the light one sees in Vermeer's work, because Vermeer's windows were approximately nine feet high. Mine, my windows were up to almost 14 feet high. So you can, you can actually duplicate the light effect that, that, that these different artists you were using in the past. And with the dark, all the dark woodwork and everything, it controlled, it controlled the uh, reflected light. And another interesting thing about the building is, 
And part of the reason why the building has survived for over 100 years is it's very narrow. It's only like 25 feet deep. And it's so narrow, in fact, that if, if the building were to uh, be turned over to developers, they couldn't even put a parking lot there. <laughs> you can only park like a car and a half. It's such a narrow lot which I think is uh, a blessing. Now this studio has been modernized, the floors have been sanded, a light wood, and all the wood, dark woodwork has been painted white. But this, this particular artist at the Fenway Studios doesn't, no longer uses, it, uses the studio as a, um, as a large setup for models. What the, in the turn of the century, when this studio was first built, you could actually think of, a, of an arrangement of uh, like women reading, uh, uh, people engaged in conversation or something. There's a large still life, very large still life. David, you've mentioned also, and this is uh, certainly interesting to our uh, viewers at home, uh, you moved into uh, Fenway Studios, I believe in the late 1960s or early 70s? 71. And it had a very interesting development then after there in 74. Would you tell our uh, viewers uh, about the developments uh, in 74? 79, you mean? The buying of the studio? Exactly. When we, in, in 1978, the building was, I believe, we were told it had the distinction of having the largest back, back taxes unpaid in the city of Boston. And, a dubious uh, honor, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, it turned out very well for, for the artists there because <laughs> with the help of uh, some local developers like Bob Keane and Abrams, and uh, uh, there was another, I'm sorry, there was another gentleman involved who, uh, whose name fails me right now. I hear they were real estate philanthropists. They, yeah, these, these men were, they got together and helped us buy the building essentially for back taxes. And then we had a heck of a time getting a loan because a bunch of artists buying a building seemed better. <laughs> it took years, didn't it, to find a bank, actually? It, we, there's only, there was, we were turned down by over 50 banks. I'm not exaggerating. A disgrace. And, well, it's, we, were, we, we became one of the first co-ops in the Commonwealth I'm not sure we may have been the first artist co-op. I'm not quite sure of that. But uh, we were one of the first co-ops in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we finally took over complete ownership by 80, 81. And we've been going ever since with the artists running the building, and uh, we had a major <laughs> structural, the work needed a lot of structural work, and we, can we switch back? Yeah. Yeah, uh, need a lot of structural work in the front, and as I said, there are 110 windows here in front, and uh, three panels to each studio. Isn't that what that that is? Yeah, there? but these are modern replacements. That's all I we see. could afford. One of the original windows actually fell out <laughs> onto the street. Fortunately, it didn't hurt anybody, but. Uh, uh, so right now we're faced with trying to maintain the building, but like the 110 windows are going to cost us like a million and a half dollars, something like that to replace them, and we simply we And there's fundraising that. going on now at the moment, isn't it? Well, to that? well, we're always looking for help, but uh, there's, no, there's no organized fundraising at this moment. I see. I, I'm, I'm particularly pleased. This is the front door of the Fenway Series, and I, uh, I researched the way it must have looked in 1905. Is that Art Deco? Is that what that is? No, no. This is, this is actually <coughs> Arts and Craft. The building is referred to as Arts and Craft. See these symbols up here? If you look at like, furniture from that period, like uh, 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 the, the work of, gosh, uh, Oh dear, I'm sorry. Are you looking from the left side of the building? No, then see, see right here. See these decorative elements here, these little white stucco things throughout the building? Of course, yeah. Yeah, these, these are typical of arts and craft designs that you would see in arts and crafts furniture. I see, the time, of course. Like yeah. stickly furniture. Yeah. Inlays, basically. In inlays, inlays. Very typical. 
And this, in the front door, an architect pointed out that the, uh, excuse me, where is it? Ah, the front door, it's, it's rather reminiscent of a, uh, of a church. We don't have a, unfortunately, we don't have a close-up of, of the entire front door, but the entire front door is rather like a, a church, and there's two lions here, and the, the lion, one of the, this lion here is actually a female, and this is a male lion. And uh, a historian pointed out that at this time in the arts and craft movement that women were as a, deeply involved in everything to do with uh, the arts and craft movement as men were. So they went to the trouble of having one of the lions <laughs> female and one male. And also an another thing, this is called blackface, this typeface, it's yeah. a gothic type. And the light over here is gothic. Arts and, craft, arts and crafts uh, design was inspired by what they called the honest construction of the uh, gothic furniture, of gothic architecture from the 12th and 13th centuries. So unfortunately, you can't see in this but the, the entire doorway. Uh, but the building was a... Uh, it's, it's called Arts and Craft Design. It's, it, it, you go into a rather large hall when you first come into the building, and there's four floors, but because of the way the building is built, oops, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Here we are. There's two levels on each floor. So I live on the third floor, but when oh, I- Oh, it's a split level uh, studio yeah, then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, That's interesting. Kind of. It's kind of split level, and, but all you have is, is really is just a balcony here. And this is a large workspace with just a little overhang under the, uh, the walkway, the hallway of the building. So when I take the stairs up, I actually have to walk up six flights of stairs to get to the third floor. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good exercise. <laughs> but um, these spaces were just so carefully thought out and... Um, so there are living quarters there as well, I now, imagine. Well, there, there's sleeping quarters and a place to prepare food at, there as well. At first, when the building was first put up, only these, these eight studios on the ends and three in the middle had built-in bathrooms. The rest were just meant to be day, day workshops, day studios. And all you had in there was a, a small sink to clean brushes and things. Uh -huh. And on each floor, they had restrooms, male and female restrooms on each floor. Separated. Separate. And, but as time goes on, it gets more and more, as we, you know, we, don't, we, live, in a, we live in a world-class city that has world-class prices. <laughs> so as property values uh, increased, it, it, then it, it, the, it, the, yeah, the building it, was it, rearranged. Right. When I, to show you how much things, things have grown up, when I first moved into the building and had a studio, yeah, had a studio, I, uh, I was paying in 1970, 74 or so, $60 a month rent for a studio. Now I'm paying, and I, and I bought the place, now I'm paying over $1,000 a month, 1100 wow. a month for, us for the, a studio. So prices have gone up a great deal. They have. But again, this structure was, put, was very carefully thought out to be an ideal workspace for artists. And, and another interesting thing about this building, when it was put up, as, we, as, as the story comes down to us, that the artists were actually involved in the planning out of, of the building. So there would be ideal workspaces for them. And uh, again, uh, so important that a workspace be properly thought out, that the values of the woodwork was taken into consideration, the direction of the windows, curtains, shades, everything was thought out to make it an ideal workspace for a traditional painter to when you're, when you're a traditional painter, you're really studying light effects in nature. That's what you're doing. And that's the style of painting that you do, David. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's been 
very interesting, particularly the historical aspects and the application uh, to your studio, the Fenway Studios uh, in Boston. Um, I believe you'll be taking a two-month uh, trip to um, oh. Antwerp, is it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be in the Low Countries. I've, I love Dutch painting, and, and some friends have arranged for me to stay in uh, Bruges, well, Antwerp, and I hope to be doing a lot of painting in Bruges, uh, which is a very beautiful, very beautiful town. And um, with canals and the architecture, it hasn't been really uh, touched since the 15th century. Bruges was a, a very important business center in Northern Europe for textiles, tapestries, and uh, it, it its income was very much reliant on a river so that they could bring, bring uh, wool and fabrics up to be remanufactured in, and in Bruges and then sent out throughout Europe. But so a very wealthy city. It was a wealthy city, but then in um, about the beginning of the 15th century, the river silted up and the harbor became unnavigable. It couldn't be used by boats any longer. So the city is sort of a time capsule of uh, 15th, late 15th century. And uh, that's where you're going to be painting. That's where I'm going to try to be painting every day for two months. In I natural hope. light. In, oh, of course, in daylight. And again, I love the low country. The Dutch uh, were just. Per square millimeter, the Dutch produce more great artists than any country in the world. And there's no doubt about that. We're looking forward to uh, speaking with you again, David, after yeah. you've uh, spent your time in, in Europe painting. Um.